Hello, and welcome to this podcast that is meant to complement the material that is being covered in the PrimeMed course, Strategies for Effective Pain Management. Hi, I'm Kate Galuzzi. I'm the professor and chair of the Department of Geriatric and Palliative Medicine at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. And I would like to, in the next few minutes, talk specifically about how we can better impact the problem of pain in older individuals. My first discussion is going to be regarding non-pharmacologic management. But before we talk about non-pharmacological management, I want to remind you that we are facing a rising tide of chronic pain in the United States. The Institute of Medicine in, in 2011 said that there were over 100 million U.S. adults currently affected by chronic pain, which is defined as pain that has been present uh, and manifesting most days for greater than six weeks. Why is it that we're having increasing numbers of individuals reporting chronic pain? Well, for one thing, we're seeing an aging U.S. population. In fact, it's been said that there may indeed be more people on the planet over the age of 85 now than have ever reached that age in the history of the world. We know that that population has been mostly survivors. They've had improved survival right, rates for, in, for injuries, and they've also undergone surgical procedures and been survivors of those uh, surgical procedures for cancer and other chronic debilitating problems. And it may even be that there's better understanding of chronic pain, which drives increased increased demand on healthcare resources for mitigating that pain. But one of the biggest things that we know is happening is that the population over age 65 has an increasing uh, projected prevalence of arthritis in the United States. And we're talking really about good old osteoarthritis, wear and tear arthritis. So from a fundamental standpoint, when we're thinking about the older population, those who we call geriatrics, we like to break them into three groups. There are the young old who are, I call them the pediatric geriatric group. They are between the ages of 65 and 75. And then we have the middle old who are 75 to 85. And it is the old old, that population over 85, who are the fastest growing cohort in the industrialized world. That said, you have to consider both physiologic age and chronologic age uh, when you're looking at your patients because as geriatricians and primary care providers, we all know that we've had middle, middle old patients, you know, 76 years of age who seem much younger. And we also see some of the young old maybe people even as young as 60 who appear to be much older because of their uh, chronic medical conditions. It's clear that this population of olders, as I call them, um, are the ones who have the highest rates of multimorbidity. They may have several medical conditions that are interacting to cause their pain and that may be causing them to seek your assistance. The other thing that we know about the older population is that some of them manifest frailty. Frailty is a difficult concept, and um, I think a lot of people think of frail individuals as being thin, but frailty does not mean that you're necessarily thin. It simply means that you have had a breakdown in your homeostatic mechanisms such that you no longer are able to perform the way you used to. You may have deficits in your activities of daily living, you know, dressing, bathing, grooming, ambulating, and toileting. It can frequently be uh, associated with weight loss, and very specifically, sarcopenia or loss of muscle mass is something that we see commonly uh, as a manifestation of frailty. And the other uh, common finding 
in older individuals who are frail is that there is significant cognitive decline as well. So for clinicians, the challenge really is to differentiate normal age-related changes from disease states uh, because aging is not a disease and pain is not a normal age-related change. Pain may in fact be due to a disease that has been poorly recognized, undiagnosed, poorly managed, and uh, simply has been allowed to cause increasing morbidity and attendant pain in the individual. One of the things that geriatricians worry about, I think, is that people who may stand to benefit the most from good pain management may not get it. Uh, we know that some seniors are not able to articulate that they have pain, and many of them are fearful of admitting that they have pain. The fear is related to the concern that the uh, pain may be a manifestation of some serious illness, and indeed it may be. Some seniors also may lack access. They may not have the financial or physical resources to be able to get the kind of uh, treatments that we're going to be recommending for them. And then some of them may have a knowledge gap. They may have a misunderstanding about pain medicine. Uh, they may be fearful that the pain medicines themselves will cause more morbidity. So this all factors into the quality of life of an individual, and it's very important to try to tease out when you're speaking with an older person what exactly it is that their concerns are. The question I like to use is, uh, what bothers you most? Um, and if what bothers them most is that they're unable to perform their activities of daily living, now you know where, where you can begin to intervene to improve not just the function of the patient, but the quality of life of the patient. So the fundamental concerns include poorly or inadequately managed pain. Pain that is not well managed can result in all kinds of detrimental things, social isolation, lack of movement, you know, subsequent immobility with all of the attendant problems that we see, including incontinence, um, pressure ulcers, DVTs, PEs, pneumonia. So inadequately managed pain can be a significant problem, can even become life-threatening to an individual who is no longer able to function um, to their highest level of capacity. The other thing that we have to worry about is the risk of adverse outcomes. As I said, there is a risk of adverse outcomes from lack of treatment, but there may be some bad outcomes from improper treatment or treatments that haven't been well thought out. Uh, certainly, overly sedating medications can precipitate falls. Uh, they can cause, some of them can cause insomnia, constipation, anorexia, and, you know, too high doses of improper medications can even result in delirium in some older individuals. Another fundamental concern that providers should be aware of is you know, there may be some cultural uh, factors that will influence how pain is experienced by an older individual or expressed by the patient and perceived by the patient's family members or providers. So we have to guard against uh, stereotypes and biases when we're evaluating pain in older individuals. It's important to try to meet everyone where they are. Another thing that concerns me is um, sometimes providers may mistake uh, decreased interaction, decreased verbalization um, as, you know, the, the patient simply not having any pain. The patient's not complaining about pain when in fact perhaps the patient due to a psychiatric disorder or dementia uh, looks stoical but is simply unable to express that the patient is having pain, that they are having pain. So it's incumbent upon us to recognize this as another potential problem. 
And I do want to spend a little time thinking about access issues because when we're thinking about non-pharmacological options for pain, so many of them require community resources. If we're recommending exercise to a patient who hasn't exercised in a long time for their pain, they are going to need assistance. They're going to need physical therapy, perhaps a physiatry consultation. Um, and, you know, lack of access to those types of services can be an impediment to being able to use non-pharmacological methods for treating pain. And, you know, that all factors into the, you know, the big buzzword now is social determinants of health, but in older individuals, the social determinants of health are very real and very compelling. So I wanted to spend a minute thinking about some of the community partners that we have. Um, for one thing, if our patients do have Medicare, Medicaid coverage uh, for their insur health insurance, they, they really should be able to have reimbursement for services like physical therapy. And physical therapy, in my mind, is an absolute mainstay in the care of patients with pain because we really do need to keep them moving. But other community partners, uh, besides physical therapists, um, are areas where seniors can seek socialization, movement therapy, uh, and other forms of assistance with their daily needs. Um, I'm, I want everyone to remember that every county in America has uh, an area agency on aging, which can help to address some of the resources that are available in a community like senior centers, can help to point to home health care agencies where physical therapists may be able to give care in the home. And then finally, remember hospice uh, and palliative care um, are very integral in helping to manage pain at the end of life. And these are very important community partners for us as we try to address this problem of pain. When I think about pain, the first thing I think about is how is it impacting the individual uh, in terms of both their physical function and their cognitive function. Because if their physical function and cognitive function are impaired, the individual clearly is going to have significant uh, deficits in their quality of life. So in terms of physical function, a good physical exam to determine what the generator of the pain may be, if it is osteoarthritis, are there some topical solutions, are there some exercise solutions that might be available for the individual. Um, and then, of course, physical therapy would be important in that instance. Hand-in-hand uh, hand with physical therapy are the other manual medicine modalities, um, like osteopathic manipulative uh, medicine or technique, or OMT, chiropractic therapy, acupuncture, massage. And then, as I've already said, exercise um, actually has had some good evidence in the literature for its, for its use, specifically with uh, Tai Chi. Um, we can recommend yoga, although some of the literature on yoga has been mixed. But certainly for people who um, have significant deficits, um, especially if they have rheumatoid uh, types of arthritis, aqua therapy or heat therapy may be very, very, very useful. Um, some of my patients don't want to go to aqua therapy because they think the pool is going to be cold or they may not know how to swim, but um, many of the physical rehab centers actually have lovely warm pools that are shallow and individuals can actually uh, be able to exercise in the water against the resistance of the water uh, without having to do significant weight bearing. It can be very, very beneficial to them in terms of their uh, ability to feel like they can move again. And, and you've heard me say this before, motion is lotion, especially when it comes to pain. What about mood? Uh, if, if a patient is not expressing their pain well, is it because of fear? 
Is it because of some psychiatric problem or have they got, uh, you know, mild cognitive impairment or even frank dementia? And we do have some tools at our uh, disposal. We can use the geriatric depression scale, which is a 30 point scale. And there is a short form, a 15 point scale. Or many of us in our electronic health records are now using the PHQ-2. And if that simple two question test is positive, we can go further and get the full PHQ-9 and uh, try to address depression. Because we know if an individual is depressed, it's going to complicate uh, not just the treatment of the pain, but it actually has been shown to, up to increase the amount of pain that the individual is experiencing. So knowing that, another option that we may look into in terms of cognitive or, or uh, if, you, if you would, intellectual me methods of addressing pain is cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which has very good, very good evidence for its efficacy. And a newer form of that is acceptance commitment therapy, where the individual accepts that they have the medical issues, the comorbid conditions that they have, but they are willing to commit to a plan so that they can mitigate and manage those problems. So CBT and ACT, uh, you know, administered by our partners, psychologists, uh, can be very, very, very helpful. So when I'm thinking about treating pain in older individuals, um, I like to think about the five, and I, sometimes I think about them as the six A's. The A's are for A, analgesia. How much pain do they have and how much relief are we able to get for that pain? Activity, and that can be measured by activities of daily living. Adverse events or effects, is an individual having bad side effect or problems with the medication or the modalities that we're using? Then, of course, we have to look at aberrant behaviors if we're prescribing medications that might be diverted. And then finally, the affect. What is our patient's mood and how can we help to help to make that mood uh, as beneficial as possible so that the patient can get the best outcome from the therapy. And then the sixth A that I alluded to is the action. The action is your response to how you're evaluating the individual for their pain. So that's just a thumbnail of how I would approach multimodal non-pharmacological therapy in older individuals. And I hope that's been helpful.